Hey, this is Joe Caminetti Jr. Welcome to the BC Podcast. We hope it inspires you and helps you in your journey with Jesus. Enjoy the message. I wanna jump right into this message today. If you're new here, my name is Joe, and along with my beautiful wife, Erin, right here, we get to serve as the pastors, and you picked a perfect weekend. If you're new here, this is the perfect opportunity to get a glimpse of who we are and what we're all about. Now, this is kind of a fun fact. If you've been at Believers for a long time, you know this, but many people who are newer have no idea that our church got started in a house. Actually, it was 41 years ago, just last month, that my parents moved back from Bible college. My mom was from Chicago, Illinois, my dad from Warren, and they met each other at, in Tulsa, Oklahoma at Bible school, and they kept feeling this tug to go back to my dad's hometown and plant the church. And this is a fun fact. The house where, the, where our church started was on Valley Camp Street in Warren, Ohio. That was a house that my grandpa built. So just a, a fun little backstory. They're gonna put a picture up on the screen of me and my brother and my uncle with my grandpa Caminetti and my grandma Josephine. It's my uncle John. That's little Joey Caminetti right there next to him and then little Dave. And so you can keep that up while I tell this story. My grandpa was a handyman of all handymans. Actually, he worked tool and die at Packard for decades. And uh, on his spare time over a five-year period of time, this is back in the 1950s, my grandpa would go home and he would work nights and weekends and he built this house from the ground up. He even went to bricklaying school so that he could learn a new uh, skill. So there were very few things he didn't touch in that house. And that was the home that my dad and his six brothers, yes, six brothers, all seven boys lived in and grew up in. And eventually my uncle Jim, the oldest son, bought that house off of my grandpa. And so by that time, my dad was getting ready to move back. My uncle Mike, who is now a pastor of a great church in North Canton called Faith Family, he was gathering all these people that were looking for a church in the basement of that home. I think they had about 40 people crammed into that basement. And of course, it didn't last for long. Eventually, we grew out of it. You know, we got a little bit bigger along the way. But you know what's amazing? I really, when I look at our church, it has never lost that family feel. And I think it was strategic that we began in a home and, and it began breaking bread together and, and just looking across the kitchen table and in living rooms and just, just walking through life together. And if you were to ask me, hey, what do you love most about Believer's Church? There's a really long list, and I bet if I asked you, it'd be a similar kind of conversation. I love the worship, it's, it's amazing, I think it's incredible, but it wouldn't be the worship. And I think the messages are pretty good, if I do say so myself, I think they're pretty great. But it's not the messages, it's not the programs, and I think we have amazing programs and ministries for the kids and for every uh, season of life, but it's none of those things. You know what, I, what stands out to me? It's the people. It's, it's just the fact that this is a family. And it's interesting, if, if you come here long enough, here's what I pray you're discovering. We said this last week, I wanna say it again. This isn't just a place to attend. This is a place to belong. This is a family. And actually, it, did you know, that is an intrinsic need in your soul. It's an intrinsic need in every single person that's ever walked the planet and ever will walk the planet. I call it the longing for belonging. There's something that you have been hardwired to want deep in your soul, and it's deeper than social, superficial connections. It is this desire to belong, and, and you need to hear this. Belonging is directly connected to becoming. And so kind of like hardwired into the process of you growing spiritually is the groups that you do it with. This is how God grows his church. This is how he develops us and molds us and shapes us into the disciples that he has called us to be. It, Christianity begins with believing, but here's the bonus. The bonus is you get a family. You, you ever heard somebody that has like a stepdad or a stepbrother or a stepsister? What do they call him? They call him my bonus dad, right? That's what happens when you're engrafted into the family of faith. It's like I have my biological family, and, and that might be good, it might be bad, it might be ugly. I don't know what your story is, but I can tell you that you have a bonus family of believers right here in the house of God. And so this is the idea that we would be able to satisfy this longing for belonging. And if you haven't figured it out, we do everything together here at BC. If, if you couldn't see in the video, we do a lot of eating together. Can I get an amen? I mean, pretty much any group you're gonna go to, we're gonna feed you. And, and that's even, half of that is so beautiful because everybody just kind of brings what they have. And you, you look forward to who's gonna bring what this week and what can I contribute? And it really just looks and feels like a family. We laugh together. We cry together. 
We, we have story time together. I remember some of my favorite memories from last semester were just sitting around bonus time around a campfire and just hearing crazy stories from Jordan Burns. Shout out Jordan Burns. If you know, you know. But this is what it looks like. And so for some of us, this is not a new concept and you've experienced this in other church families. But for some of us, this is a foreign concept. And today, here's what I pray God would begin to do. I pray he would just begin to rewire the way you see relationships that he would help you to see that he renews and redeems and restores and revives things in our life through relationships. I just wanna talk about that for a few minutes. And actually what I want to do is just simply look at a story. This is found in three of the four gospels. And I wanna take a look at the gospel account of Luke today. And this is a story about a miracle that Jesus performs, but it is equal parts a story about people who get to participate and partner with Jesus through relationships in the miracle. So I think this is gonna help us to see the power of relationships in a brand new light. Let's read this together. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along or of course, follow along with me on the screen. This is Luke chapter five, verse 17. On one of the days while Jesus was teaching, some proud religious law keepers and teachers of the law were sitting by him. And they had come from every town in the countries of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And I like this, and the power of the Lord was there to heal them. Can I just take a time out today at Believer's Church and just remind you that the power of the Lord is here to heal you too? The power of the Lord is here to heal that marriage that's on life support. The power of the Lord is here to heal your estranged relationship with your kids. He's here to heal your body. He's here to heal your mind. The power of the Lord's here to heal you. Does anybody else believe that as we come to church today, that he's here to heal? The same God that healed back then wants to heal right now today. That's what he specializes in doing. You know what's funny? It, it's describing this large group of people that are gathered in this house to see Jesus. And it says that there are a lot of religious law keepers and Pharisees there. And they weren't there to support Jesus. This was not a Jesus fan club. They were there to trip Jesus up and to find fault in what he was doing. But I love that the Bible still says the power of the Lord was there to heal them. Do you know that Jesus can even heal you of your religion? And I don't mean religion in the sacred form. I mean the religious thinking that we have. The idea that God can only do it this way because this is how he's always done it and God bless it. This is how he's gonna do it in the future. God's saying, no, 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 I, I live outside of your boxes. I live outside of your constraints and your constructs. This is what we believe God is doing even here. And uh, so let's keep reading here. There's a large gathering at this home. It's in Capernaum. Fun fact, many believe, scholars will tell you, it could have been the house of Peter. And so if you go on a tour in the Holy Land, you can actually see the house where they believe that this happened. It's not a big house, but it's bigger for the day. And there were all these people crammed in. I mean, it was standing room only and this is what happens here because word is spreading fast about Jesus and his ministry. Let's keep reading. Luke 5, 18. Some men took a man who was not able to move his body to Jesus. Another gospel account tells us it was four friends. So there are these four friends and they see their friend who needs to get to Jesus and they realize he can't get there on his own. So he was carried on a bed and they looked for a way to take the man into the house where Jesus was, but they could not find a way to take him in because of so many people. This is my favorite part. They made a hole in the roof over Jesus where he stood. This story always gets me because I love the miracle side of it, but I always think about the perspective of the homeowner. That had to be a weird day as a homeowner. And if it's Peter, you know, Peter's just barely saved. You know, he's not quite sanctified. He's a sailor. You know, he's about to go Mike Tyson on somebody. Look out for your ears. You know what I'm saying? If, if you know, you know. Took a second for that one. But just imagine this scene unfolding. And can, can you imagine the claims adjuster here in that story? You know, that's a weird claim on your homeowner's policy. But here's the point. Everybody needs four crazy friends who are willing to do whatever it takes to get them to Jesus. This is what churches are all about. This is what a local church and a local church family is all about. And I like that phrase. Let's read this again. They looked for a way to take the man into the house where Jesus was. Can I just tell you that is the church we're building, that we are a group of people that are determined to see our friends and our family and our neighbors and our coworkers, anybody that we're around, we're determined to help them get into the house where Jesus is. 
Can you imagine what God could begin to do? He's already doing, but could you imagine what he would begin to do if all of us were committed to ripping off the roof and helping people get to Jesus, whatever the obstacle? Let's keep reading. Then they let the bed with the sick man on it down before Jesus. And I like this. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, this is interesting. In many of the miracles where Jesus heals someone, he says, your faith has made you whole. But in Luke's account, he doesn't say your faith, the faith of the man on the mat, your faith has made you whole. He recognizes their faith. It wasn't the faith of the man who was on the mat. It was the faith of the four friends who were lifting him up. And I love that about Christianity in this journey of following Jesus. There are plenty of moments when our faith is strong and we feel like we've been standing on the mountaintop and we have faith to believe God for bigger and faith to believe God for better and to believe for the healing and to believe for the breakthrough. But there are equal times in my life where I don't have any faith and I get by with a little help from some of my friends. And there are moments where people in my life invade my life, interrupt my life, love on me and lift me when I cannot lift myself. That's what we see in this story. Now, I think this is interesting Watch what happens next. Jesus, if I'm just gonna abbreviate a very small part because you could preach a whole message on it, but he speaks to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. It's another message for another time, but watch how the story ends. Verse 24, he said to the man who could not move his body, I say to you, get up, take your bed and go to your home. And at once the sick man got up in front of them and he took his bed and he went to his home thanking God. And all those were there were surprised and gave thanks to God saying, we have seen very special things today. I can't tell you how many times I've been driving home from a service, driving home from a connect group, and I'm just replaying over and over what God just did. And I'm just thinking, man, God, that was special. We saw God move today. I'm hungry for more of that. I'm looking across the room and I can just remember specific moments. Usually it happens in week three or four or five after you've built some connection and relationships and you start to pray for each other. You just start to walk through pain together. There's something otherly that happens that can only happen when the Holy Spirit drops into those relationships. That's what I'm craving. That's what I wanna see in your life. And I'm telling you, it can only happen through relationships. Relationships help us rip off the roof of whatever it is that's keeping us from Jesus, and I love this story, and this could absolutely fall under the category of a story of Jesus' power to heal, because it for sure is a display of Jesus' power to heal. But you know what else is happening here? This is equally a story about the power of partnering with the Holy Spirit, partnering with Jesus to do the healing. Did you know that Jesus wants to move in your life, wants to move in our world, and in his sovereignty, God moves in all sorts of different ways without our approval or our you know, suggestions, but most of the time when God moves, he chooses to do it through us. He partners with us. That's that's what's happening in in this story. There's this man who needs help, and the people do the bringing, Jesus does the healing. In other words, they do their part, God does his part. And I want you to just begin to think about that. What would it look like if we could be a church that builds those kind of connections to Jesus, if we could partner with the Holy Spirit to watch people's marriages change, if we could partner with the Holy Spirit to watch somebody meet Jesus. I can't tell you how many times I've had someone come to the Connect Group, and the more I start to talk to them, I realize they don't even know Jesus yet. And I wear that as a badge of honor, that they would feel connected and comfortable. And then naturally, sometimes it doesn't happen on the spot, but naturally they start to get hungry. They just say, man, what is it that brings you peace? And we can say things like, man, I don't know what I would do if it wasn't for Jesus. I was talking to my friend Joel before service, and he said, how do people do this without Jesus? And I thought, yeah, that's that's the story for every one of us. Now, I wanna point something out. As we build a house of belonging, it becomes a house of healing. But you know what else stands out to me about this story? We've covered in many messages as a church the perspective of the man on the mat the perspective of the four friends that are carrying the man on the mat. We've talked about the Pharisees and the law keepers. I want you to think about another group of people that are present in this story. How about all the other people that are in the house witnessing the miracle? And I want you to think about this. They had needs. They had things that need healed. They had hurts that they needed to bring to Jesus. 
They had come from all over the region to hear from this person, and and word was traveling that he was changing people from the inside out. They came to get a word from God too, but here they are in the middle of a service with a massive interruption. Can you just imagine what it would be like if while the preaching was happening, somehow somebody got some kind of saw or fell through the roof and it was just there, right? It would be an interruption. I can tell you this, it wasn't a clean, pretty process. It wasn't quiet. There was debris and dirt and dust flying all over the place. And here's the point. If you wanna build a house of healing and a church where people can meet Jesus, be ready for interruptions. Be ready for inconvenience. Actually, when I think back to my life, anytime I have gotten to participate and partner in a miracle with Jesus, it was always inconvenient. It never happened at the time I wanted, in the way I wanted, but it was the most beautiful inconvenience of my life. I'm just wondering what God could do with a group full of people, a church full of people, a small army right here in Boardman, Ohio, in the region surrounding that say, I am willing and ready to be inconvenienced by Jesus so he can heal people. I'll do whatever it takes to bring my friends. I know God placed me in my neighborhood so that I could love them to Jesus. I know he placed me in my cubicle. I know he placed me in my locker room so I could love people to Jesus, even if it's inconvenient. Miracles are messy. Miracles are messy, but it's the most beautiful thing in the world to participate in. So let me just ask you this. How is God asking you to be inconvenienced right now? Let me give you a good example. I think most of you know we've been praying for a youth pastor. And so we had God answer our prayer for a children's pastor, and Pastor Terry has been doing an awesome job. The team is is thriving, and there's a lot of exciting things coming. By the way, we had a lot of moms that had babies in the last couple of months, and a few people step away from that team. We could use 10 or 15 amazing people right now. And so maybe for you, it's just being inconvenienced to say, I'm going to be a part of that. I don't, you know, kids aren't necessarily my passion for the rest of my life, but I could give you a year of my life and help build that team and be an encouragement to kids and watch God do something. I'm going to go through growth track. I'm going to talk to Pastor Terry today. Uh, But here's here's a cool example. So we don't have a youth pastor yet, but can I tell you, I'm praying and fasting for it, and I'm watching some cool things happen. But in the meantime, we have an awesome young man. Uh, He's a young adult from the Warren campus, and he said, hey, I want to fill in the gap in the meantime, and so he's going to lead a group for Paramount called The Bridge, and he's gonna have gatherings throughout this semester for your students here in Boardman and for the students in Warren. So it's gonna kind of bridge the gap until we find the next step. And so can we just give it up for that? That's a cool example of just how, I can tell you it's not convenient. He's going through school. He's got all kinds of reasons not to do it. If you wanna be a part of that and help students, or if you have a student sixth through 12th grade, you can sign up today in the lobby or on the Church Center app, just look for that group. So that's the power of connection. Here's here's what we're up against. Oh, let me say this, just while we're on it for inconvenience. Last week, I'm looking at all the signups for our groups, and I'm seeing that we have an overabundance of signups and people, great problem. We could use about 10 more groups, and we have a lot of groups. I think we might have the most we've had uh, since the existence of Boardman. And so I'm wondering if God's tapping some people on the shoulder by his Holy Spirit today and saying, you are an amazing host. You have the gift of hospitality. You don't have to talk, but you can encourage people and open up your beautiful home. Some of you don't have a hospitality gift, but you have a leadership gift and you could lead a connect group and you could invite people and you could bring people in your neighborhood to church and you can, you can care for people and disciple people. Whatever it is, I'm just challenging you because listen, we're building something beyond what we see right now. And I believe as people start to get a hold of this, something's gonna happen. Something's gonna pop off in the Holy Spirit, all right? So here's, here's where I wanna end. We've talked about the power of connection. Let me just explain to you what you're up against. We have never lived in a culture that's more disconnected, more isolated, more alone. Did you know, I'm gonna just read from the Surgeon General. These are some words from him, Vivek Murthy. He has declared loneliness and isolation, the nation's latest epidemic, calling it an urgent public health issue. He states loneliness is associated with a greater risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, stroke, depression, anxiety, and premature death. The mortality impact of being socially disconnected, listen to this, is similar to that caused by smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day. Some of y'all thought you quit and you're right back to it. And even greater than that associated with obesity and physical inactivity. So get this, loneliness increases the risk of premature death by 26%. Isolation increases it by 29% according to the study. 
the reason that we have a longing for belonging is because this is the best way for us to live. And so I wanna just end with an encouragement. You know, this is a scripture that we quote often, but I just wanna look at it from a different angle. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. Now I wanna highlight one word in, in here. It's the word spurring. Have you ever seen a spur on a cowboy boot? Can we all agree that spurs are not comfortable? <laughs> Actually, it's a temporary moment of discomfort for the horse that enables them to go in the right direction. And if they're veering off the course, just, it's just a little moment of discomfort that helps push them back where God wants them to go. That's the idea. And there's so much encouragement wrapped in that. And, and I love that it says, spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And I just wanna show you a, a visual of what I'm talking about. They're gonna put a picture of, of, I think, what perfectly illustrates what happens on the screen here. Brandon, what are these called, Beyblades? Children of the 90s will remember this, or parents of the 90s, Beyblades. But I want you to see, I think for some of us, we can relate to this person in the center, this blade in the center. It's kind of not moving. It's not able to move on its own. But God starts to surround us with people. And how fitting is it that there's four, four bay blades to help it, right? Just to illustrate our point today. And it begins to get us going. This is the church. When we can begin to be surrounded by people, even when we don't want it. Can I tell you, there have been moments in my life where I didn't even want what God wanted for me in my life but I was too connected to give up on it. I was too connected to stop serving him. I was too connected not to get up. I'm telling you, this is what happens as we connect with other people. We always say it this way, circles are better than rows. And I wanna end with a story. There's a young man who got to lead worship here today. Actually, he's on the front row. Can we give it up for Zach right here? This happened over the summer. Aaron and I were actually out of town. And we, we got this, this call that there had been a horrible accident that Zach was in. And it was, it was scary and the car was totaled, right? I mean, it was pretty much a total loss. He was okay, but he was rattled and all the things. So I got to talk with him over the phone. I think we voice memoed each other back and forth and maybe got to talk for a minute. But it was amazing, in my absence, it just reminded me of how much we need people, how God works through relationships. Just one person after the other started to jump into action and to talk to Zach and his parents and to pray with him. Actually, the next day, he was just having a really rough day and I asked him, can you just remind me what happened that day? And this is what he wrote. It was the day after the accident, which just so happened to be a Thursday, and I was so overwhelmed with thoughts and fears and worry and emotions from the enemy. I called and went up to the church and the worship team stayed after to comfort, talk to me, pray over me. Further support was provided in the following days and weeks with get togethers and food and prayer. And I'm honestly still so grateful for everyone, including you guys, love you, man. Can I just tell you that this is the church? This is why we exist. Actually, they were telling me that the way they prayed for him that day is they just kind of made a circle around him. They just encouraged him and prayed for him and spoke life over him. This is what we're building. This is what Jesus has asked us to do. I'm gonna invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. There might be someone here today, maybe a few, who this resonates with you and there is a longing for belonging, but you can't honestly remember a moment in your life where you said, Jesus, I, I call you Savior. I call you Lord. I wanna belong to the family of God. And here's the cool thing. It's as simple as putting your faith and your trust in him. And you gain a heavenly father who's closer than a brother, who loves you through thick and thin, who loves you just right where you are. But then he loves you too much to let you stay there. So if you can't remember a moment in your life where you said, Jesus, I don't just acknowledge that you're God or you're out there somewhere. I don't just acknowledge there is a God. I say, Jesus, you are my God. You are my Lord, my Savior. If you can't remember a moment in your life, the Bible says it real simple. It says, just believe in your heart. Say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you'll be saved. Rescued from an eternity separated from him 
in a place called hell, inherit a place called heaven, an eternal home. But here's the cool part. The Holy Spirit makes his home in you in the here and now and empowers you in everyday life and your family. You get the bonus family, the bonus dad, the bonus mom, the bonus brother and sister. So if you can't remember a moment in your life where you've prayed that prayer, I just wanna lead you in a prayer. Can everyone else help us out? Just say this with me. Say, dear God, thank you for Jesus, for the price he paid to make it possible for me to belong to the family of God. I receive the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Hope you enjoyed today's podcast. There are a couple things I'd love for you to do. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. That helps us spread the word and impact more people. You can also help us see others connected to God by investing today at believers.cc slash give. And if you want updates on all things Believers Church, check out believers.cc or follow us at A City Connected on Twitter and Instagram or search Believers The Connecting Place on Facebook. The best way to connect with BC is live and in person at one of our weekend worship experiences. We have locations in Boardman and Warren, and you can get the service times and plan your visit at believers.cc. Thanks for tuning in to the BC Podcast.